You are an excellent technical person, an accomplished computer scientist or engineer. You have that superpower that few others have of being able to program, to design, to do the math, to work out the equations, to make complex systems work. That's great. Your superpower makes you valuable in the job marketplace. But there's a missing part in your technical education, a crucial additional skill that could multiply your market value as a competent techie by a factor of two, three, even 10, depending on how good you become at it. And it's not something you usually get taught explicitly, even if you study at a famous university. And I know because I teach in one. Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. I am a professor of security and privacy in the Department of the Science and Technology of Computers at the University of Cambridge, a university that this year happens to be ranked number two in the world. I teach a variety of undergraduate courses, currently algorithms, discrete mathematics, and cybersecurity, and I also give people PhDs in computer science. Our students graduate from our course with outstanding technical skills, and the top tech companies in the world can't hire them fast enough, because these employers know from experience that with our students, they get the genuine article. High caliber techies who will be immediately productive without having to go through another six months of internal training. I'm very well aware of the typical skill set of a top class techie and of how much this kind of graduate is worth in the marketplace. Several of my top students get their bachelor's degree and promptly go on to a much higher salary than my own. But that's just a starting point. What I'm going to tell you today is how you, as an accomplished techie, can make yourself significantly more valuable than you already are by learning an additional complementary skill. I call it a complementary skill because it is not one of the usual techie skills that you get taught officially in your degree program. It's not any of the things that I or my departmental colleagues give lectures on. It's not about algorithms, programming, software engineering, mathematics, uh, high-speed networking, or any of that stuff. It's instead about expressing your thoughts clearly. The crucial complementary skill I'm talking about is learning to write well. And well means, first of all, clearly and unambiguously, so that there's no chance that you will be misinterpreted, but also engagingly, in a way that makes your readers want to keep reading. And of course, in a grammatically correct form, that goes without saying. Learn to write well. Why is this important for a techie, you might ask? I can program, I can design and build systems, I can make the difficult calculations that produce the correct parameters that make the system work efficiently. Writing prose is stuff for humanities people. Okay, those who can't do the maths and can't write code. So let me play to my strengths and do the stuff that only we, not them, are able to do, right? Well, yes, your techie superpowers are definitely the reason why those desirable employers want you and the reason why you will never be unemployed unless it's you who decide that you want to take a break. But the additional complementary skill of being able to write well will dramatically increase your reach. It will increase the impact of the technical output you're able to produce. And if you play cards right, then it will let you multiply your income by a significant factor. Of course, the quality of what you are able to do on the technical level is the foundation of your worth in the marketplace. You're a brilliant developer, you get hired by one of the fangs at high salary, and you're basically spending your days and nights in there in front of the sexiest computers money can buy with delicious food served to you for free. And there's playrooms, you have clever colleagues, there's free massage sessions, geek toys, and all the rest of it. And I've been a fang employee too, so I know the environment firsthand. But if all you do is just the technical work, which you do very well, then you kind of disappear into the system and nobody actually sees the brilliance of what you do except your immediate colleagues and your line manager. Maybe a lot more people use what you do, but very few know that you are behind it. Maybe someday you get a brilliant idea for something new you'd like to build. If you're great at writing C++, but you can't express yourself eloquently in English, how can you persuade those about you to buy into your vision and let you do it? You might write the code in your spare time and show them a prototype and that might get their attention and they might that you give it a try, but it only works for a small-scale one-person project, not for the grand visionary ideas where you need to convince someone higher up to give you plenty more techies to work on your project with you. Or what if you don't work for a mega corporation, but rather you run your own company? Well, if you're great at the technology, you might be able to build a wonderful product, but how is it ever going to take off? How are you going to convey the excitement of your idea to those who would buy your product or to those who might invest in your company? What I've come to realize after several decades in technology, both in industry and in academia, is that being able to write well is a severely underrated secret weapon that many techies mistakenly ignore, but which helps the strongest ones get well ahead of the pack. The fundamental requirement for being successful in your career is that you must give value to others 
The more value you give others, the more successful you will be. But for this to work, you also need to get recognition for the value you have given and for the further value you have an offer for later. And so communication is also crucially important. Doing is clearly the most important thing and it comes first. But if you can't communicate what you did or what you're capable of doing, it will not be seen, it will not be appreciated, it will not be used and it might ultimately go to waste, even if it's very good. In the research context, whether you're a research scientist in industry or a tenure track academic who hopes to become a full professor one day, what should get you promoted is the quality of your inventions, of your discoveries, of your theories, of your ideas. It's not how many hours of hard work you put in. You don't get promoted for that. It's how many great things you come up with. You're not judged by input, but by output. And that's great. That's why I like to be in this space. Results-based meritocracy. Your worth is the value of what you're offering to the rest of the scientific community. But the currency of that world is essentially citations. Okay, You may have come up with the most brilliant idea, but you will only get the payback for it to the extent that other people notice it, pay attention to it, talk about it, build more stuff on top of it, and ultimately cite the scientific publication in which you describe your fantastic idea and share it with the community. So it's a necessary requirement for your advancement in research that you produce scientific papers. But writing the papers, while necessary, is not sufficient. Even having brilliant ideas and doing brilliant practical work to implement and to validate them, even that is necessary but not sufficient. On top of all that, your papers also need to be read by others and liked by others and shared by others and used by others and cited by others as the foundations that helped those others build new stuff on top of yours and write their own follow-up papers. And for your papers to be read widely, they have to be well written, they have to be engaging, they have to communicate clearly and retain the attention of the readers. If you won't learn to write well, you'll have a hard time at this game and it's unlikely that your papers will gain many citations. Over the years, and I'm not telling this to brag, a few of my scientific papers accumulated over a thousand citations each. That certainly contributed to my own career advancement. There are quite a few colleagues in my department who got the full professor without any of their papers ever reaching a thousand citations, so this metric did make me stand out a bit. Uh, but a paper that is hard to understand and boring to read is somewhat less likely to attract many citations. Uh, the story is similar even if you're not into research. Okay, As I said earlier, you still need to communicate your idea and your vision effectively to be appreciated and listened to. Another example, you're watching me on YouTube, so you might notice the similarities with this rather different world. Okay, On YouTube, the currency is views, watch time, likes, subscribers, and so forth, which are in some loose sense the equivalent of scientists reading research papers and citing them. Of course, on YouTube, you don't have the peer review process and basically anyone can publish any piece of junk they like. However, despite the mediation and the bias of the YouTube recommendation algorithm, which decides what gets suggested to viewers, it is still viewers ultimately who vote by deciding what to watch. And the more they choose to watch and like your videos, the more you ultimately get rewarded. And clearly, this is less likely to happen, even for a video that contains a super brilliant idea, if the video is boring to watch if it doesn't tell an engaging story, if it has poor audio quality and so forth. So in basically in every context, the quality of the framing influences the reach of the message. Whether you are still a student or already a professional, whether you are in industry or in academia or even in government, then if you have a talent for technical stuff, please appreciate the fact that being able to write well will multiply the value you can get out of your technical talent. Invest in yourself and learn to write well. If you can only do the tech stuff well, but you can't communicate it to others, at some point in your career, uh, you will reach a kind of plateau, okay? And your progression will be capped. You will always remain the minion of someone who can communicate better than you can. The antagonistic dichotomy between sciences and humanities is sometimes a bit silly, actually. You may be a techie, you may be a very good techie, but it does you no good to focus exclusively on mathematics and computer code and dismiss your humanities side entirely. To be successful and more importantly to be happy, we have to be full human beings. We can't let one side of ourselves just uh, atrophy completely. So even as a scientist, if I want to get other people excited about what I do, then when I give a lecture, when I present at a conference, or when I write a book, I have to give a bit of a performance. I have to become an actor and a storyteller and a writer besides being a scientist and an engineer. Otherwise, I'll lose my audience, you know, death by PowerPoint. Some techies are monstrously boring 
Uh, and by the way, some humanities people are too, for that matter. It's not because you're a professor of literature that uh, all of a sudden you're automatically able to write or present well. So, uh, well, my point is, don't dismiss writing well as something that only humanities people should care about. Learn how to express yourself in a clear, articulate and engaging way, and this will make you not only a much more successful and appreciated techie, but also a better person overall. When I say that uh, the, this uh, writing well is a skill that will make you richer, I don't mean it just in the literal sense of finance, but also in the sense that it will enrich you as a human being. Now, how do you go about learning to write well? It's a creative endeavor, like learning to program well, or to compose moving music, or to draw beautiful pictures. And I believe there's really no course that can teach you how to do any of those things. A course can teach you the mechanics, the rules, the necessary tools you need to master before you can express yourself well. And another kind of course might give you some hints on how to stimulate your creativity. But ultimately, I believe that creativity, that spark, is something you have to find inside yourself. And then you have to refine it and polish it with practice. Okay, so to learn to write well, I'd suggest starting by reading well-written stuff. Look for the stuff you actually like reading, the stuff you find engaging, the stuff you, you just can't put down, the stuff you read even when you should be doing some other stuff. So, for example, I love Frederick Forsyth. He's my favorite thriller writer. I have all his books. Uh, and also I love Dave Barry, one of my favorite humor writers. And I enjoy plenty more writers that it would be pointless to start listing here, but who are your favorite authors? What makes their writing engaging for you? What hooks you in and keeps you turning the pages? And it can be a technical book or a novel or anything really, but just read, be an active reader. Appreciate how your favorite authors construct their sentences, how they make words flow into each other and uh, how they intersperse images and flashbacks, how they build tension to make you want to get to the end of the chapter, how they construct an engaging story, how they make you laugh, and so on and so forth. Absorb all of this and try to redo it yourself in some small sense, at a small scale, just as an exercise. You're not trying to become a novelist or become a humor writer. You're just trying to flex your writing muscles, like just going to a mental version of a gym. It will take work, but you won't get anywhere without hard work and lots of practice, as with anything. So just do it. Write. And try very hard to get other people to comment on what you write. Get them to tell you what was clear or unclear, what was hard to follow, why it was hard to follow, what was ambiguous, what was boring, what got them lost along the way, and so forth. Eat your pride. Request criticism. Accept criticism as a precious present. Learn from criticism and act on it. If you're still at a formative stage in your career, like when you're still a university student, then grab all the writing chances you have, even if they're optional. Essays, proposals, mini papers, uh, writing competitions, anything. If it's for technical coursework that you have to write something, then of course you'll get comments on the content of what you write. But do your best to elicit feedback also on the form as well, on whether your writing was clear and engaging, and on how you could improve if it wasn't. Sometimes, the person who's giving you feedback, who might be your teacher or might be your peer, might tell you that, you know, that content, honestly, just wasn't that engaging. But they might not necessarily have much of a clue on what you might do to make it better. And accept that. Even such disappointing and unactionable feedback is useful, if you have the humility to take it for what it's worth, namely pointing out that there are areas that you might improve on, even if they couldn't tell you how. Uh, up to you to figure it out. Remember that in this context, you're not writing poetry, where ambiguity is often valuable and purposeful because it makes readers think and search and it lets readers you know, put their own interpretation on your ideas and images and suggestions, uh, which uh, the poet really means as um, just triggers or inspiration for the reader. No, it, that's not what we're doing. Uh, what you want to be doing when we're talking of writing well in a STEM subject, uh, we explicitly aim for clarity and lack of ambiguity. Your prose must be the channel through which your brilliant ideas flow easily and without distortion from your mind to the mind of your reader, who then gets that satisfying light bulb about something they didn't know or didn't understand before, and now they do, thanks to you. And that's the value you are offering to the other person. And you must make the utmost effort to ensure not only that it is possible for your idea to go through this channel, but rather and much more demandingly, that it is almost impossible for your idea not to go through 
or to arrive in some distorted fashion. Marcus Fabius Quintilianus was a writer, rhetorician and educator in ancient Rome, 1st century AD, and what he had to say on this matter is just as relevant today as it was 2000 years ago. In his Institutio Oratoria, he advised, we should not speak so that it is possible for the audience to understand us, but so that it is impossible for them to misunderstand us. And I'll give you a trivial example. My university department here at Cambridge, uh, where the first store program computer in the world uh, was built, the EDSAC, by my academic ancestor, Sir Morris Wilkes, used to be called the computer laboratory. But now in the 21st century, most outside people would misunderstand this name as a kind of, you know, computer support facility, perhaps a place where technicians would fix your laptop if you broke. And that was not the mental image that we wanted to convey. Most other universities call our kind of place, you know, the Department of Computer Science. But we didn't like that name either because it seemed to put the emphasis just on the theoretical and mathematically oriented parts of computing. And while we do quite a bit of that as well, we are proud of our strong tradition as system builders, you know, from processors to hypervisors to operating system software to high performance networks. So we ended up with Department of Computer Science and Technology. Now, unfortunately, this is also prone to misinterpretation. It is just a noun phrase. It doesn't even have a verb, but it already suffers from a parsing ambiguity. Most people will parse it incorrectly as Department of Computer Science and Technology. So this is a department that studies two things. It studies computer science and it studies technology. Wrong. That's not what we meant. What we actually meant was this is the department of, of two things. You got that right. But the two things are computer science and computer technology. So you should not put brackets around computer science. You should put brackets around science and technology. And then the word computer that's in front should distribute over both of them. Now, of course, I objected to the proposal name at the time uh, on the basis of this ambiguity, but you know how these things go on and uh, all the clear alternatives were much too long to use in practice for a name that was already a bit too long to begin with. So we're not stuck with what we have, Department of Computer Science and Technology. But when I say it, I have to put the brackets vocally, Department of Computer Science and Technology. Uh, or sometimes I rearrange the words and I say Department of the Science and the Technology of Computers. Because as a disciple of Quintilian, I, it annoys me profoundly to send out a message that could, and in fact probably would, be misunderstood. I have plenty more examples of ambiguous writing from prose written by my students, and I do my best to teach them to recognize parsing ambiguities and to learn to eliminate them when I supervise their dissertation writing, for example, or for graduate students when we co-author a paper together. And I also have plenty of examples of lower level problems that, honestly, people should have learned to avoid in primary school. English is only my third language, and yet I have to correct adult native English speakers who write it's with apostrophe, meaning it is, when they said intended it's without apostrophe, meaning the item belonging to that thing. And they should have learned to try that substitution in their head when they were eight years old. Leaving this kind of primary school grammatical mistake in one's prose conveys the same aura of disrespectful carelessness as turning up to an important meeting with smelly armpits. Just don't do that. This is how to make you look ignorant and how to make your excellent technical output be worth a lot less, not a lot more. Conversely, being able to convey your technical content in an understandable and engaging way will definitely get your recognition, sometimes profit. Some time ago, my company, Cambridge Cyber, did some work for a government client, at the end of which I had to write a technical report for them as the final deliverable. And this is the testimonial we received from them afterwards. Cambridge Cyber was a pleasure to work with and deliver high quality, meaningful work, blah, 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 all very nice. Thank you very much. And go to the end. We are especially grateful for a final report that even made us laugh out loud. You don't hear that every day. So in this case, writing engagingly and with a, even a touch of humor made sure our important cybersecurity technical messages got across. It ensured that our report, instead of just you know, being filed and forgotten, was shared internally by our client and passed on to the higher levels in their organization and even got us repeat business from them the following year. So understand this. Being able to write well is just as important to your success as a techie as being able to do the difficult technical stuff that most regular people cannot do. You are among the few who can do the hardcore techie stuff. Great. However, if you are so geeky that you can only do that, but you cannot explain it to your grandmother in a clear, articulate and engaging way, then you'll never get the full credit you deserve for it. Whether you're talking about your undergraduate dissertation, your corporate proposal to your boss, your professional report to your client, or your entrepreneurial pitch to your investors. So invest in yourself, 
learn to write well, it will compound the value of your technical abilities and the returns will be amazing. Here's a video I did a while ago on how to write a good undergraduate dissertation. Even if you're not a university student, if you listen with an open mind, it contains plenty of hints that will be useful to you when writing other stuff as well. I hope you get something out of it. If you want to bring a smile to my face, hit the like button and say liquor is root in your comment to let me know that you made it to the end and you enjoyed this video. Many thanks for watching and see you in the next one.